Well, we said, I think, that when you take psychedelics, you go up a dimension. And so this world of transience and flux becomes an eternal world. So in that sense, it's the same thing. Uh, whether meditation and psychedelics are the same thing, I think depends on your meditation and your psychedelics. Uh, meditations, different meditations strive for different things. Much meditation is about emptying the mind of phenomena. This certainly would not be a description of the psychedelic state. Ultimately, the meditation path and the psychedelic path must somehow lead to the same kinds of data if the claims of both are to be respected, which is that they give deeper knowledge about uh, about reality. Yeah. And I was wondering, as a kind of connection between that and the point that you were just making previously about the expression of those um, inner states through art, whether what um, your view might be on the use of some of the technologies today that are aimed at providing access to those inner states in, uh, in a more, in, uh, say more, uh, we, we, you've mentioned about the psychedelic one of the problems is bringing back the information. And um, so I'm thinking here about some of the machines uh, and particularly the technology of Robert Monroe aimed at providing um, access consciously to those states such that you can bring that information back in the record. I'm all for it. I just haven't seen anything that convinced me that anybody had achieved it to any degree of significance. Uh, yeah, you know, imagine a drug that did nothing more than allow you to remember your dreams. I mean, that's not exactly shooting for the moon pharmacologically these days. And yet, a drug which allowed you full recovery of your dreams might unleash God knows what, because we don't know what we dream. Uh, the chemistry of DMT suggests that in deep REM sleep it's possible every single night you have a DMT flash. But the, it does not transcript into short-term memory. So, uh, or imagine a drug which allowed you to uh, enhance long-term memory so that you could slip into reveries of a summer day 30 years ago and play it back moment by moment by moment. Uh, these, again, this is not shooting for the moon pharmacologically. We're not talking immortality here. We're just talking simple uh, neurochemistry. But all of these possibilities would change uh, life beyond recognition. Uh, and I think these things should be pursued by any means necessary. You know, it's a false dichotomy, the, the idea that somehow you should be able to achieve these things on the natch and they're not authentic if you achieve them through psychedelics. I, this is just a con to keep the lineages in business, I think, because they don't want you going off the ranch and and uh, charting your own course. Uh, but where shamanism becomes priestcraft, it's already well on its way to senescence. Uh, Terrence, when you collectively perceive it, together as a group taking mushrooms, you collectively perceive it, similar phenomena, without in, speaking. In couple situations, I've had telepathic things. I've had in group situations very quasi-telepathic social interactions. For, and what I mean by that is I'm recalling an evening many years ago taking ayahuasca with these people and they had a weird scene going. The shaman was a good guy and a good shaman, but he had a nephew who was a jerk and was sort of a pimp and kind of a hustler. And, uh, and the shaman was singing with his three friends, these ancient, ancient songs. And this guy was drunk on a guardiente, and he would sing against them. 
he would sing against them. And this was in Peru, and if you know the style of rural Peruvians, people are so polite and so not up front that no social problem is ever dealt with directly. People will will tolerate incredible bad behavior without turning on the person and saying, listen, you're completely out of line, knock it off. So 30 people, 30 Peruvian campesinos were witnessing this sing against. And, uh, and the woman I was with at the time very much didn't like what was going on. And at the end of this, this nephew, the Sobrino, at the end of his song of raucous interruption, I looked up just as he ended. The room was almost complete darkness. I looked up just as he ended. I saw her look up and look at him with a look of utter disgust. And when these red dot, dart things got to him, it knocked him off his feet. And I heard the old shaman was sitting right to my left, and I heard him turn to his friend, and he said, Ah, the gringa sends the... the (laughs) And so it was like, wow. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, then ordinary reality immediately reasserts itself and moves forward, and there's no time to say, Wait a minute, folks, uh, something paranormal just happened here. I want to interview everybody, get your impression. Uh, It's never, you know, when it's real, it's always caught up in the on-moving flow of events. Resisting and fearful, Uh, in other words, to resist what comes forward. Well, if you've taken, what you don't want to do is take, here's, this is reasonable advice too, I think. Where the problem area lies, people think it lies in taking too much. It lies in taking too little. Because if you take too little, you can resist it. You can struggle with it. And then it can turn into a real mess because you're afraid of it and you actually have the power to some degree to resist it. What you want to do is take sufficiently enough that there's no escape and that the transition from ordinary reality to fully loaded is as quick as possible because the going up is somewhat terrifying. For example, let's use psilocybin as the model. Here's how it works for me. This is not tea. This is eating raw mushrooms. It comes on more slowly. So after an hour or so, you know, of, and the way I do it is I sit. in after, As soon as the mushroom enters my body, I sit and meditate. Uh, I noticed in South America they don't do it like this. They dose the ayahuasca and then everybody just goes on talking about their motorcycles and the jobs at the sawmill and uh, who's conning. It's like totally, they toss it. There's a brief moment. They pour. They toss it down. Then they all go back to raving at each other about mundane life. And then 30 minutes later, on the dot, the shaman blows his whistle or shakes his shakyapa, his leaf, uh, dry leaf bouquet. And everybody settles down and it's like it comes on within two minutes. As soon as the guy starts singing, he just invokes it. The way I do it is I, uh, I take the mushroom or the ayahuasca and then I sit and I roll bombers uh, so I'll have them ready if I need them and then and I just sit as I'm going to sit during the trip and I've unplugged the telephone and I've uh, gotten everything squared away and it begins to come on at about the 40 minute or the 60 minute mark and as and it's there's sometimes some nausea as it comes on and then I smoke a bomber or half a bomber. I, and, then, and then it catapults it into the full deployment of the thing where you just hang on. There's about a 25-minute period where all your only job is to, is to hang on. It builds. It's like watching an atomic explosion on the other side of 50 feet of absolutely clear crystal glass. I mean, you can't believe this is happening 
quote unquote, in my mind, you have the feeling that everybody from Seattle to San Diego is just crawled under their desk as this thing tore past, but it's in your mind. And then, uh, then there is the interaction with it, which moment to moment, you are pretty coherent, but you lose it. it a lot of it does not transcribe into short-term memory. And then after about an hour or 40 minutes of that, it becomes more manageable, more memorable. Uh, the most mind-boggling parts of it are just not possible to bring out of it because language fails. Because English, there are no words. There are no words even close. I mean, sometimes you'll bring out an image or a metaphor, but out of five hours of tripping, you bring out, you know, half a notebook page of metaphors, and yet you were entirely engaged during that time. Now, this question about fear, which is a real question, because when everything begins to slide, if you are not, if it's 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 more than most people who haven't done it expect. They have heard it, they've read the books, they, they but they think it's a metaphor. They don't understand. It's really going to happen, and it's really going to happen to you. And there's a tendency to clutch or to try and resist it. The thing to do in those situations, I think, and it's counterintuitive to how Western people think. But the thing to do is to sing, <coughs> to sit up, not to assume the fetal position. See, you, what you might tend to do is assume the fetal position and tell yourself, my God, this is the most appalling thing that's ever happened to me. If I can just live through it, it'll be all right. I've taken this drug. If I can just wait through. How long did they say it will be? Seven hours. Uh, I see it. It's started two minutes ago. Uh, if I can just... No, the thing to do is to sit up and to sing. And why? Well, being practical people, to oxygenate your brain, to move this, the entire... This thing that's happened to you, though it may have one claw in heaven... Its roots are in your neurophysiology and in the chemistry of the drug. You want to move your physiology around. So oxygenating your brain can't fail to do this. So you sing. And this almost always is accompanied by a sense of power, control, equilibrium, and so forth and so on. Not always. I mean, let's face it. You're a product of a nutty society and there are unexamined crevices and uncleaned out drain traps in all of us and, uh, and you're going to encounter that stuff. The good news is the earlier psychedelic trips tend to deal with that. If you will quickly discover taking psychedelics that either you can work through your personal issues and become a psychedelic explorer, or this is just stronger medicine than you are up for, and you would be far better to go back to psychoanalysis or whatever works for you. Uh, some people just can't take it. Uh, why is that? Well, because what it does is it dissolves boundaries, and most of us are over-boundary defined. But some of us are having an uphill battle getting some boundaries in place and realizing we are not the telephone or the tree or the person we live with. Uh, and so for those people who are having trouble establishing and maintaining boundaries, this is the last thing on earth they should get involved. Cannabis. Oh, Cannabis. 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 <laughs> You're in the state that you're experiencing the total loss of ego or boundary. Is it possible that your physical self could just literally stop? Because I have... Well, people often... Yes, wonders. <laughs> often people wonder. You, you get into a place where it's so unfamiliar that, you, that the question comes up, 
have I done it this time? You know, are, am I dying or am I in danger? The, the answer is the odds are incredibly against you being seriously in danger. People don't die from psychedelics unless they have uh, heart conditions or some incredibly rare medical condition. The problem is that the ego feels threatened by the boundary dissolution and its ace is your self-identification with it. And it can actually say to you, you are dying. And here's the evidence. And you have to say, no, it's unlikely. Uh, and sing your way through it. But this is really tough. I mean, ta- this is, you know, the Buddhists talk about slaying the ego. This is slaying the ego for real. You must slay it, uh, otherwise it will spread panic into your whole psychological system will, will give way to panic and hysteria. So, unless there is some real reason to think you're dying, and you should have done your homework, you should know what to expect. For example, if you take uh, LSD and begin intense bouts of vomiting, this is not a proper reaction to LSD. Something is wrong, either with the LSD or with your relationship to it. You should know what, because a typical trip will put you through changes, but is not dangerous. But if you suddenly begin exhibiting uh, some symptom, uh, heart fibrillation or or something like that, then you want to have, uh, this is why then the, there's always the issue of the buddy system. Should there be somebody else there and what about all that? My position is if you're anxious, then you should have a sitter. If you're going to do it alone, you should certainly tell someone so that they will check on you after a while. Uh, I don't like doing it in groups or with sitters because inevitably I get spun into them. Uh, you, what I want to do is go as deep as possible and be it. And even if I'm alone with one other person, culture is the third guest at the table. You know, if you start. I mean, I've often found myself in the middle of psychedelic trips thinking, I'm sure glad there's nobody else here to see this because I'm sure it would alarm an observer because I have my leg thrown back up over my neck and I'm screaming in Urdu or something. But it's okay. After a few minutes, it's okay. But if there were an observer, they would feel the need to do something, you know. And often, like I've seen people... you. you smoking DMT and people moan and they say no 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 and they moan and so then you know you get them back together and constituted and you say how was it and they say it was fantastic (laughs) so you realize you know how they present is not uh, reliable well setting has a great deal to do with it and setting is a very complicated issue setting means everything from the astrological situation at the time that you do it to the physical surrounding that you're in and it's also it's a roll of the dice you never know exactly what you're going to get as far as the question about Buddhism and all that my own You know, when I started taking LSD, I thought I saw in Tibetan Tonka painting and mandalas the echoes of the same world and pursued it, went to Nepal, studied Tibetan, collected the art. Uh, And it is similar. I don't know. I don't know to what degree the Buddhists, the Mahayanas realize those states without psychedelics. I do know that with psychedelics, those meditations, those techniques, those insights are supercharged. And I would suspect that 
Tibetan Buddhism, as it has its roots in Vedic Hinduism, there may be psychoactive plants in its past, but it's far in the past. Buddhism was brought to Tibet in 741 by Padmasambhava. There was an autochthonous shamanism already present throughout the Himalayas, the Punpo. And it was largely based on cannabis intoxication at that point in history, not so much in the present. But I, I think that this, this is a fruitful area. I just can't believe that Mahayana Buddhism could have gotten as far as it did without some reliance on on psychedelics. And of course, cannabis, we in the West, our style is to smoke it. And that's a very mild way of dealing with it. I mean, if you eat, if you have unlimited amounts of high-grade cannabis and you eat grams and grams of it, you will have experiences as extreme as anything that psilocybin or, or ayahuasca can deliver to you. You only have to read the descriptions of 19th century writers on cannabis. Uh, Fitzhugh Ludlow, S. Weir Mitchell, uh, these, these people, their descriptions of their trips are as psychedelic and as out of control as any acid reportage or psilocybin reportage. So the relationship of Indian and Buddhist spirituality to cannabis and other psychedelics is not well understood. We do know that the whole Rig Veda is a hymn to a drug, Soma. But we don't know what Soma is. Well, the fact that that it could have invited such attention to this Vedic civilization. The 95th mandala of the Rig Veda says, Soma is greater than Brahman, greater than Indra. Well, what is being talked about? How could such a great thing be forgotten and lost? What was it? Uh, and then, and you know, the, almost as puzzling as what was it was, how could you lose such a thing? I mean, it's like us forgetting how to make automobiles or something. It was something so basic to the culture that how could you possibly forget something so central? Yet, apparently, they did. And today, there's scholarly fights. Was it Amanita muscaria? Was it psilocybin? Was it Pagaman harmala? Uh, or was it something else? And why is this so hard uh, to figure out? The only thing I can imagine is that it must have been eventually restricted to a priestly class of initiates. And then there must have been a social revolt from the bottom and all those people were put to death. And then nobody knew what it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you have to push these psychedelics to reach these unitary states. What it seemed, what always fascinated me was hallucination because it seemed it was to me the proof that I was dealing with something outside myself. Well, and here was stuff that amazed me that I couldn't make up on my own or that would, you know, a single image would have taken me hours to draw and figure out. And here I was getting 28 frames a second of this unpredictable stuff. 